Good morning, Watermark family. My name is Meg Ziegler, and I have the privilege of sharing the Word of God with you this morning. If y'all could open up your Bibles, we are going to be in the book of Luke, chapters 19, verses 41 through 48. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you have known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling, saying to them, it is written, and my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it into a robber's den. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among them, the people, were trying to destroy him. And they could not find anything that they might do, for all the people were hanging on to every word he said. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Watermark Fort Worth. So good to be gathered with you today. It's already been an incredible morning of worship. Uh, so glad that you're here. Um, my name is Parker Haynes. I'm the student ministry coordinator here at Watermark Fort Worth. And this morning, we're continuing in our study of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, I hope that you were with us last week because last week, Jason taught on Luke 19, verses 28 through 40, which is Luke's account of the triumphal entry. And just in case uh, you were not here last week or you're unfamiliar with the passage, uh, Luke tells us about this scene that happens at the culmination of Jesus's journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. So for the last you know, number of weeks, we've been looking at Jesus and his disciples as they're going about their way, heading to Jerusalem. Jesus is performing miracles and authenticating himself as the Christ. And last week we looked at as Jesus is riding into the city, there is this amazing celebration. There's this great uh, messianic fervor that has developed among his followers. This anticipation that this one who's doing these signs, performing these miracles, this is the Christ. This is the one who is going to save us. This is the one who's going to inaugurate the kingdom. He's going to establish the kingdom of God in our midst. He's going to throw off our oppressors. He is going to save us. There's this amazing uh, zeal uh, and expectation as Jesus is riding into the kingdom. He, we see that he's doing so on a donkey, uh, which is in fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 6. Uh, where I'm sorry, Zechariah chapter 9, where Zechariah writes these words. He says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The people in the triumphal entry are throwing their coats on the ground, shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So it's this really climactic moment that everything we've seen in Luke so far has, has led to this moment where the people are seeing Christ for who he is. They're celebrating the salvation that has come in him. And then as we continue to read into today's passage in verses 41 through 48, we see that in the midst of this celebration, among all the cheering and all the shouting and all the joy and all the excitement, that there is one voice in the crowd that is weeping and it's coming from the Lord Jesus. It's a dramatic picture and it begs the question, why is Jesus weeping? That's the primary question we're gonna be aiming today because I think by understanding that question, we unlock the text. Why here in the midst of this celebration is our Lord weeping? And to answer that question, uh, I just have to tell you, we have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, I would confess that in my study of this passage this week, I have become convinced that this is one of the most theologically dense, 
biblically layered passages that we have looked at thus far in the Gospel of Luke. So uh, my invitation to you this morning is to, is to lean in close and listen attentively to the Word of God because this is an amazing passage and, and you need to see what is here for you. There's much to be profited from. So we're aiming to ask the question, why is Jesus weeping in the midst of this celebration? My goals this morning are simple. I want to explain the passage so that you can understand it. And my, my aim, the effect that I hope that it will have on you is that you would leave today seeing Christ more clearly. That is central to why we're even studying Luke in the first place. My hope is that you leave this place having a more full picture of who Jesus is. As he's revealed in his word, as he's revealed to us by his spirit, who our great savior is. And my hope is that in response to seeing him rightly, seeing him clearly, you would love him deeply. You would respond to him the way that he ought to be responded to. You would rejoice in him the way that he ought to be rejoiced in, that you would submit to him as king of the universe, uh, that you would heed his words as the one true prophet and love his atoning as our great high priest. I'm so excited for this passage. Uh, let's go ahead and get into it. I'd love to pray for us and then we'll, uh, we'll get on our way. Well, Heavenly Father, we come before you uh, just as always, Lord, amazed by how kind you are to reveal yourself to us in your word. We know that that is not something that is owed to us, uh, but it is a miraculous display of blood-bought grace. So I pray that now as we consider this passage, that you would open our eyes to see who your son is. You would grant illumination to our souls. You would magnify the name of Christ that we might delight in him now more than ever. Come and glorify yourself in this time. We ask for your blessing, Lord. We love you. We know you loved us first, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So before we jump into this passage, uh, I think there's two lenses that we need to look at this passage through. Uh, first, we need to be considering this passage from like the narrative level. And what I mean by that is we have to ask the question, what's going on in the Gospel of Luke? So on a big picture, you know, how does this passage fit into what has come before it? And, and how's Luke developing his narrative right here in verses 41 through 48? So that's one of the levels we have to look at this passage from. The other level is an even bigger picture level, which is the biblical theological level, where we're asking the question, how is Luke engaging with other biblical ideas, other theological themes, if you will? How's he engaging with those themes and how's that inform our reading of this passage? Does that make sense? So we're looking at it from the narrative level, like Gospel of Luke, and then the biblical canonical level, how does this passage interact with the rest of Scripture? So uh, I would suggest to you that those two things are, are critical to help us understand this passage in its fullness. So uh, first of all, on the narrative level, how does this passage fit in to the Gospel of Luke? Well, I would submit to you, if you just look at your Bibles, I think we should take verses 28 through 41 as kind of one big narrative unit. It's, it's good uh, to break them up and consider them individually. It's good that we do that. But we must always remember that when interpreting scripture, we cannot understand these passages in isolation from one another. So 28 through 41, one big section. Uh, and over the last couple of weeks, if you've been with us, we've been really focusing on the theme of Jesus coming as the promised Davidic king. If you remember that the last two weeks, we talked about how he is coming to inaugurate his kingdom. And one day when he returns, that he will consummate the kingdom. And then last week, Jason taught us about Jesus riding in on a donkey and embracing the role of messianic king. So that's one of the huge themes that we've talked about so far. But what we're going to see today, something you need to be aware of, is that the office of king is not the only biblical office that is established and anticipated in the Old Testament and then fulfilled in Christ. It's not the only office. In fact, there are two other offices that are established in the Old Testament and fulfilled in Christ that we're going to see today in the passage. It is true that Christ is the Davidic king, the promised offspring of David, but he is also the true prophet of God 
the prophet like Moses, and our great high priest. Prophet, priest, and king. Those three offices are the offices that we see established in the Old Testament and fulfilled in Christ that qualify him to be Christ the mediator. The one who can stand between God and man. The one who can bring us back into right relationship with our creator God. Uh, in theological terms, this is called, this threefold office of Christ is called the munis triplex. Munis triplex. I have to confess, I learned that this week, uh, but I found that very exciting. And I thought maybe you would find it exciting to learn a new word as well. So, you know, keep that in your back pocket when you're playing words with friends. Munis triplex. I tell you that uh, not just because it's fun to talk about theology, uh, which it is, but because understanding those big picture biblical ideas is vital to understanding today's text. So what I would like to do is uh, just give you a brief Old Testament survey to show you where these themes of prophet, priest, and king find their origin so that you know that I'm not, I'm not just making this up and that you can see that Luke is genuinely uh, grabbing these themes to, to inform the way he writes this passage. Sound good to you guys? So this is just a forewarning. This is a 30,000 foot flyover of a, of a theology that is well worth your you know, hours of study, uh, but uh, we'll give it a shot this morning. So first, to understand the Old Testament roots of the offices of prophet, priest, and king, we really have to return to the garden. Because we see that in creation, uh, God created Adam and Eve. He placed them in the garden and he gave them a commission that you're familiar with. And that commission was to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with the glory of God. You're, you're familiar with that. But what you may not be familiar with is that in so doing, in giving this commission to Adam and Eve, the Lord established Adam as the first prophet, priest, and king. And just to unpack that a little bit, Adam was a prophet. What do I mean by prophet? Well, Adam was given the words of God. If you go back and read Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, uh, you're going to see that God speaks directly to Adam, giving him his, his commission and giving him the prohibition that he ought not eat, he must not eat, of the, uh, free of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the day that he does, he will surely die. Adam received that word, and it was his job to proclaim that word to all of creation and bring the creation into submission to the word of God. He is God's representative. So in that sense, Adam was given a prophetic responsibility. But more than just a prophetic responsibility, Adam was also given a priestly responsibility. Uh, we see in the beginning pages of Genesis that Adam was to cultivate and tend the garden. In, uh, in theological terms, the garden is the first temple of God. It's the first temple, the first holy place that we see in the Old Testament. So Adam is assigned to cultivate and keep pure the sanctuary of the Lord. And in so doing, he's commissioned as a priest. And then lastly, something you're likely familiar with, is that Adam was appointed as a king to rule over and have dominion over the creation as God's vice regent. He was to rule and reign in submission to the law of God. So we see in those first couple pages, Adam established as prophet, priest, and king. And of course, in the eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam failed in all three of these offices. Uh, he was meant to proclaim God's word to the creation, bringing the creation into submission to God's word. When the serpent came whispering deceptive lies in the ears of his wife, Adam should have moved into that moment. And when the serpent says, you will not surely die the, the day you eat of this fruit. He should say, no, that's exactly opposite of what the Lord told us. The Lord told us the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. He was meant to have that prophetic responsibility, but he, he falters in his responsibility. He steps back, he cowers away from the moment and his wife is deceived along with him into eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not only does he fail in his prophetic responsibilities, 
but he fails in his priestly responsibilities because he was to cultivate and keep pure the sanctuary of God. When he finds the serpent who is whispering blasphemies, he should have seized the serpent and cast him out of the garden. But instead of doing that, again, he shrinks back from his responsibilities and he allows the sanctuary of God to be profaned by sin. So he fails as a priest. And then last and maybe most obvious, he fails as a king. Adam was given the responsibility to rule and reign over the creation and, and keep it pure, keep it holy, have the creation walk in obedience to the law of God. And instead he ushers sin into the world. So these three offices, prophet, priest, and king are entrusted to Adam. Adam as God's son fails to, to execute these offices and thus is unqualified to be the mediator, the, the one who can stand between God and man. That's the first time we see these kind of offices develop in the Old Testament. But uh, as you continue to read your Bible, you will see that this is not the only place where prophet priest and king are established. Here's a, uh, here's a Bible pop quiz for you. You don't have to answer this out loud. I normally on Wednesday nights have our students answer out loud, but you don't have to do that. Uh, here's a pop quiz. Adam was called God's son. Adam was to be the mediator between God and man. He failed as that. Who else in the Old Testament is referred to as God's son? Again, you don't have to answer out loud, answer in your head. And, uh, I know somebody's leaning over to their neighbor and going, is he talking about Jesus? Uh, that's a good answer, but that's not what I'm looking for because I'm saying specifically in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, after Adam, who else is referred to as God's son? Israel. Israel is called God's son. And just like Adam was entrusted with these three offices, so too Israel was entrusted with these three offices. Uh, we see that Israel is called to have prophets who speak on behalf of the Lord as established in Deuteronomy 18. And they're to have priests who tend to the sanctuary of God, keeping it holy as established in Numbers 18. And they're to have a king who would rule in righteousness in submission to the law of God as established in Deuteronomy 17. So these three offices entrusted to Adam have now been entrusted to Israel. The problem is it doesn't take long at all to recognize that exactly what happened to Adam is going to happen to Israel. In Numbers chapter 20, we see Moses striking the rock, producing water from the rock in disobedience to the Lord and in so doing showing that he is not a qualified prophet. We see in Leviticus 6, Nahab and Abihu, uh, the sons of Aaron offering, they're meant to be the, the priests of the temple of God, and they're offering strange fire on the altar, uh, profaning the sanctuary of the Lord. And, you know, in the book of Chronicles, we see a, a line of unrighteous kings who do not walk in the way of the Lord and do not lead the people in righteousness. And then in the book of Kings, we see that even the good kings weren't really that good. So as you're reading through your Old Testament, you're just smacked in the face time and time again with the reality that Israel, who has been called to be prophet, priests, and kings, are failing in all three offices. Just as Adam failed, so too Israel failed, and thus they are not qualified to be the mediator between God and man. However, as you're reading through your Old Testament, you will start to see this developing hope that one day, there would come a Messiah. There would come a Savior. And this Messiah would be a good king. He'd be the best king. He'd be a perfect king. And not only would he be a good king, but he would be the true prophet of God. He'd be a greater prophet than Moses. And not only would he be a good king and a good prophet, but he would be a great high priest who would make, make pure the sanctuary of God and atone for the sins of the world. That's the theme you start to see developing in the Old Testament. Uh, I wanna show you briefly some of these things so you can get eyes on them for yourself. Listen to what Moses says in Deuteronomy 18. So just for reference, you know, we all know, we're familiar with the idea that the Davidic king is promised in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New. We're pr that's pretty established, right? What you may not know is the same exact thing is true for the true prophet and the great high priest that I wanna show you. So Deuteronomy 18, this is the word of Moses. Listen to this. 
The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. Side note, does anyone remember what the Lord said to Peter, James, and John on the Mount, Mount of Transfiguration in Luke chapter nine? Do you remember what he says? He says, this is my son, my chosen one, and you shall listen to him. So we have an allusion to Deuteronomy 18, authenticating Jesus as the promised prophet. It's a pretty interesting reference, but uh, continuing in Deuteronomy 18, it says, this is according to all you have asked of the Lord, your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly saying, let me not hear again the voice of, my, of the Lord my God and let me not see this great fire anymore, I will die. And the Lord said to me, you have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I have commanded him. All the way back in the days of Moses, we are already seeing this developing expectation that one day God would rise up a true prophet, a prophet greater than Moses, who would speak the very words of God. And not only would God raise up a great prophet, but he would raise up a great high priest. Look at Zechariah chapter six. It says, Behold, a man whose name is Branch. And you're like, what type of name is Branch? Uh, well, it's a reference to Jeremiah, who's talking about the righteous branch that would come from David. So a man whose name is Branch, he will branch out from where he is. He will build a temple to the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build a temple to the Lord. And he will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus, he will be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace will be between the two offices. So here, the branch who will be the king is also going to be the priest. And, you know, I could go on and on referencing Old Testament passages to show you how there's this expectation that there would one day be a prophet, priest, and king who can be the mediator between God and man. But I tell you all of that because those biblical threads, those themes that are developed way back in the Pentateuch have been running throughout the course of scripture and now are starting to converge and find their resolution in this passage. I want you to see how Luke engages with these themes to develop Luke chapter 19, 41 through 48. So uh, I wanna show you how in this passage, just like in the last passage, Jesus showed himself to be the promised king and embraced that title. I wanna show you how in this passage, he does the same thing, that he is the true prophet and he is the great high priest. So take a look at verse chapter, um, verse chapter, uh, chapter 19, verse 42. As Jesus is weeping for Jerusalem, this is what he says. If you had known this day, even you, Jerusalem, the things which make for peace. But now they have been hidden from your eyes for the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. That is really uh, striking and arresting language from Jesus. And uh, I've, got a, I've got another pop quiz question for you. As a student of scripture, as you're thinking, if you're, you're hearing Jesus' words here and you're thinking, okay, what else in the Bible does this remind me of? Like, Who's Jesus sound like here as he's riding into Jerusalem and he's lamenting over the sins of the people, warning them about the wrath of God that is to come if they don't repent. What's that remind you of? Who's he sound like? He sounds like the prophets, doesn't he? He sounds like Jeremiah. That's exactly right. Someone mouthed Jeremiah. Doug, that was awesome. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. He sounds like Jeremiah. He sounds like these prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, who would warn the people about the wrath of God, that if they don't repent of their ways, the judgment is 
coming. He exactly sounds like that. Um, he's saying, just like the Assyrians were invading, I mean, this is what the prophets would say. If you don't repent of your sins, if you continue to walk away from the Lord, the Assyrians are going to invade. The Babylonians are going to carry us off into exile. Therefore, repent and return to the Lord. So as Jesus comes into Jerusalem and he's saying the same exact thing, that if you don't repent, the enemies are going to tear this place to the ground. And of course, here he's talking about the Romans. He is establishing himself as the final installment in this biblical pattern. Does that make sense? We've had this escalating pattern of prophets. Here Jesus is as the final true prophet. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. And we know even more clearly that's what he's doing when later in the passage we hear him say, my house is to be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And when he does that, he's, he's quoting two passages. It's a synthesis between Isaiah 56 and Jeremiah 7. And, and I wish that I had time to get into the weeds on both those passages because uh, they're both amazing. But I just want to read you an excerpt from Jeremiah chapter 7 because it just shows you crystal clear how Jesus, in saying these things, establishes himself as the promised prophet. So this is Jeremiah 7, starting in verse 1. It says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the house of the Lord and proclaim this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah, who enter by these gates and worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words, saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you practice justice between man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, then I will let you dwell in this place, the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, and offer sacrifices to Baal, and walk after other gods that you have not known, and then come stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered. That you may do all these abominations? Has this house, which has been called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? Behold, even I have seen it, declares the Lord. But now go to my place, which was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at first, and see what I did to it, because of the wickedness of the people Israel. And now, because you have done all these things, declares the Lord, and I spoke to you, rising up early in the morning and speaking, but you did not hear, and I called you, but you did not answer, therefore I will do to the house which is called by my name, in which you trust, and to the place which I gave to your fathers, as I did in Shiloh. In case you're not familiar with the biblical significance of Shiloh, Shiloh was the place that the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant dwelt before the construction of Solomon's temple. And we see in 1 Samuel chapter 4 that because of the wickedness of the people, the Lord allowed the Philistines to invade the camp and carry off the Ark and leave Shiloh in Ruins. So when, when Jeremiah is standing here, he's saying, you men of Judah, hear the word of the Lord. Because of the way you've turned your back on him, because you've gone after other gods, because you've practiced all kinds of abominations, the same thing that happened to Shiloh is going to happen here. Don't you remember what happened last time? Why do you insist upon your own destruction? Turn and, and turn back to the Lord. Repent of your sins. If you don't, the same thing that happened there is going to happen here. And of course, that's exactly what we see happen. In 586 BC, we see that the Assyrians come, I'm sorry, the Babylonians come and they invade Jerusalem and they decimate the temple. 
and they carry the people off into exile. That's Jeremiah chapter 7. That's the passage that Jesus quotes in Luke chapter 19. So when Jesus is standing here 600 years later, standing on the very same ground that Jeremiah did as he's prophesying over the people, Jesus is saying, my house is to be a house of prayer. You, just like your fathers, have made it a den of robbers. Oh, Jerusalem, why do you insist on your own destruction? Why do you not recognize the things that make for peace? Why do you turn your back on the Lord because of your wicked ways, just like the Babylonians did and the Assyrians did before them and the Philistines did before them? The Romans are coming. And they are going to tear this place to the ground. They're not going to leave one stone left upon another. And then, just as Jesus predicted, 70 AD, the Romans do come. And they set up these massive siege works and they've got these catapults that launch flaming boulders over the walls of Jerusalem, setting the city ablaze in reducing Jerusalem to rubble. As Jesus stands before the people at the gate of the city of God and proclaims the word of the Lord, he warns them about the wrath to come and shows himself to be the final installment in this biblical prophetic pattern. He is the true prophet of God. But Jesus, here in this passage, isn't only functioning as prophet. He's also functioning as priest. He's stepping in as the final installment in the biblical pattern of the priesthood. After Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem, he goes to the temple and he drives out the money changers and the sellers who had turned the house of the Lord into a marketplace. And man, I wish we had time to explore all the biblical significance of the temple being profaned by secular activity. But um, for, for our purposes this morning, it, it must suffice it just to say that throughout the Bible, as you're reading the Old Testament, there is a theme that develops of the sanctuary of God being profaned by that which is secular. And we have a developing pattern of those who would serve in a priestly role who are cleansing the temple of that which is secular and restoring true worship in the house of God. Uh, you might, your brain might go to the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, right? Who in the, in the return from exile are laboring to purify the people and restore worship in the temple. Or you may think of the kings of Chronicles who, the good kings at least, were so resolved to bring reform to the temple worship because the people showed this proclivity to constantly backslide into idol worship. So time and time again, we see the sanctuary of God contaminated by the secular and purified by the priests. And here in this passage, as Jesus enters Jerusalem and goes into the temple and drives out the money changers, he shows himself to be the final installment in this priestly pattern. And of course, you know, uh, Jesus's priestly ministry will reach its more full culmination in the weeks to come as he goes up the mountain with the cross on his back and makes us atonement for the sins of the world. But I tell you all of that to say that here Jesus is, right? So imagine the picture. Here Jesus is. He's riding into the city. He has for years shown himself to be the Christ. He is the promised king. He's the king who comes from David. He is the true prophet, the greater prophet than Moses. And he is the great high priest who is here to make pure the people of God and atone for their sins. And the people can't see it. They are totally blind to see this great messianic hope that they have been banking on for centuries. They've been waiting on it for so long. And here he is. Today is the day of their visitation. Today is the day of salvation. And they do not recognize him. That's ultimately why Jesus is weeping. It's an it's a utterly heartbreaking moment. 
He says, oh, Jerusalem, if you only knew the things that make for peace, if you could only see me for who I truly am, if you only recognize that I'm the promised prophet, I'm the promised priest, I am the good king, and I'm here to offer peace terms to you. But you don't have eyes to see it. It's a, it's a heartbreaking moment. The apostle John, you know, he notes this in the very beginning of his gospel account. You're probably familiar with, with these verses. This is John 1, 9. It says, There was true light coming into the world, which enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, but the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Despite all that God had done to reveal himself to his people Israel, despite how clearly he had manifested himself through redemption history, through the prophets, and now through his son, They do not have eyes to see him. And their spiritual blindness leads to their spiritual deadness. That's really what the image of the secular, you know, profaning the sanctuary of God communicates. It's that the people's eyes have grown dim to see the Lord. And because they can't see him, their hearts have grown cold towards him. The people of God have become secularized. And it's for that reason that Jesus weeps. That he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. So, the question for us becomes, what do we do in response to this passage? Right, like the, the passage, and really, I'd say more than that. What do we do in response to this entire biblical storyline, right? It's like all the way from Genesis to now is one story. How should we respond to what's happening here in Luke chapter 19. Jesus, who is prophet, priest, and king, has been rejected by his very own people because of their spiritual blindness. And because they rejected God's peace terms in Christ, judgment awaits them. That's what this passage communicates. That's the main point of this passage. The question we're asking now is, okay, if that's what the passage says, how do we respond? And, and you know, I think the answer is obvious, isn't it? We, church, you, Christian, must not reject God's peace terms. We must recognize the fact that God in Christ has visited incredible mercy on us. And if we neglect the day of our visitation, that he will visit wrath upon us. Something, uh, something that you need to realize is that this situation, you know, this drama that's unfolding with Israel, we've seen it since the beginning of Luke and way before that, and we're going to continue to see it. This redemptive drama that we're seeing, that's not just Israel's story, right? This moment where Jesus is riding up to this rebel city and proclaiming God's peace terms and they're rejecting him. That's not just the story for Israel. That's the story for the entire world, You know, Israel functions in a certain sense as like a redemptive microcosm that gives us insight into a greater reality about what God is doing in Christ to redeem fallen humanity. So as we see Jesus ride into the city as prophet, priest, and king, it gives us a picture of what God has done in Christ to extend his peace terms to us. So in closing, uh, I just want to like paint a picture for you. I don't know if it's a story or an illustration or an analogy or whatever it is, but I just want to paint a picture for you that I hope helps you see the situation that that Israel was in and that you and I are in today. Um, I'm going to ask you to just imagine this with me. Imagine that we are all citizens of a cosmic kingdom, a kingdom that has no bounds, right? Uh, sea to sea, river to river, uh, eternal kingdom. We're all citizens of this kingdom. And the king of the kingdom is the eternal creator God. Uh, Everything finds its beginnings in him. Everything owes its existence to him entirely. And uh, for our purposes, all of us, you and I, along with all of humanity, we live in a certain province of that kingdom, okay? We'll call it the city of man, right? We live in the city of man. That's a city within the kingdom of this creator God. 
And you and I, because of our foolishness, because of our sinfulness, because we have cold, hardened hearts, have rejected the rule of our rightful king. We have become rebels. We've become a renegade city. We've insisted upon our own way. We've seceded from the kingdom of God and we've declared our autonomy and we have become his enemies. Now, the king who rules over this cosmic kingdom is omnipotent. He is the most powerful king in the universe. He is the commander of an uncountable multitude, literally angel armies. He is the Lord of hosts. And he has sworn that he will, in total justice, deal with all kinds of sin and rebellion against him swiftly and justly. However, while this king is perfectly just and totally powerful, he is also perfectly loving and endlessly gracious. So before the battle lines are drawn up, before the angel armies roll up to the walls of our rebel city and lay siege to it, the king sends a messenger. He sends a prophet who is carrying the very words of God. And this prophet comes riding into our rebel city saying, hear ye, hear ye, the, the word of the king, the, the gracious king of this, of this kingdom has today declared that pardon is available for you. The king desires that none of you rebels would perish, that all of you sinners would come to repentance and enjoy eternal life in his kingdom forever. Today, total amnesty, total pardon is offered to you if you will have it. The terms of peace are simple. All you must do is lay down your arms, abandon your sins, submit to the rule of your rightful king and enjoy his free gift of grace. We would surely ask, how is it possible that a just king, a righteous king, could offer such gracious peace terms to us, us renegades, us rebels, us sinners? Will he not keep his word? Will he not see to it that every sin and rebellion against him will be, will be paid for, will be, will be dealt with justly? And the prophet would respond to us, you are right. Every sin, every rebellion will be dealt with justly. The good news that the king has provided a high priest who will make atonement for your sins if you trust in him, not by the blood of goats or bulls, but by his very own blood. And we would say, how is it that the blood of one man could possibly atone for all of our sins? And the prophet would say, behold, I am not only the prophet, but I am the priest and I am the king. I am the very son of God. I am the, the mediator between God and man. I am the Lord Jesus Christ. It is by trusting in me that you can have a relationship with God. Hear my peace terms. Trust in me. Believe in me, follow me. I came to die in order that you might live. Place your faith in me and you will have peace forever. Would that we, Watermark Fort Worth, know the things that make for peace? If you're in the room today and you have never submitted your life to Christ, if you've never accepted his gracious peace terms, wouldn't you do that today? Wouldn't you lay down your arms, lay down your sin, abandon your pride 
and recognize that today is the day of your visitation? Wouldn't you submit your life to the reign of your rightful king and enjoy his free gift of grace? If you're a follower of Christ, if you've accepted these gracious peace terms, wouldn't you enjoy the privilege of being a citizen of heaven? Wouldn't you live a life that makes obvious the fact that you were once a rebel and now you've been forgiven? You were once his enemy, now you've been made his child? Wouldn't you live a life that makes obvious the fact that he has forgiven you an eternal debt, therefore you owe him everything? Wouldn't you make it your life's goal to know Jesus Christ more, your prophet, your priest, your king? Wouldn't you endeavor to see him for who he truly is and as a result of that, love him as he deserves to be loved for the glory of God and for your eternal satisfaction? Wouldn't you make it your life's aim to glorify God and enjoy him forever? I hope that you will. And I would love to pray for just that. Let's pray together. Well, Sovereign Father, we are blown away by your grace to us. We are astonished by the terms of peace that you have delivered to us through Christ, that by his wounds we can be healed, that his blood is sufficient to wash away all of our iniquities, that he's the bread of life. Lord, I pray that by your spirit, you would soften our hearts, open our eyes to see Christ and respond to him thusly. Father, we love you. We know you loved us first. We ask you in Jesus' name, amen.